Good morning, guys. Oh, good afternoon. My apology. Day two, week twelve. Kidding yesterday, twenty-five. Well, guys, eight days up to June sixteen to complete your assignment. And don't forget, once I'm done after the sixteen, so on the Thursday, Friday. Uh, 18, 19, and on the last week, I will be keeping teaching all the way to the 26th, Friday the 26th, and what I will do, I will uh, complete some very important concepts that need to be reviewed for this course that we haven't had time yet to cover in depth, and I will also be introducing you guys to the major element of globalization, the main topic for the 10-2 course that will begin for you in the fall. So that way there will be a lot of work that will be done ahead of time for when we're back in class, you know, and catching up since March 30th plus having to do the social 10-2 course. I have also posted this morning into the stream section of our Google Classroom the information as far as how to register for summer school this summer. There is summer school offered. Mr. Koshka sent us about three and a half, four weeks ago all of the documentation that I have posted already. But just to help you out, guys, if you are interested into taking summer school to either do one of the course right now that you're struggling or to get ahead for next year, please go into today's stream. You will find information in a next, uh, what is it, a PDF document with all of the information as far as how to register for summer school. And don't forget, if you're going to register for summer school, you need your Alberta education student number, not your Edmonton Catholic School student number. And you can get that quite easily by contacting your teacher advisor. Uh, today, I'm going to go very slow and I will not go too, too, too long because I know a lot of you are very going hard right now into completing your semester with all of your course into the summary of that chapter 12 into our book on sustainable development. Yesterday, I have explained the assignment of the week and have begun by looking at type of map that are created from geographer, the people studying the science of geography, to make our life easier as far as navigating around. Yesterday, we saw on page 273 about the equal area projection map that's into the first paragraph of P of page 273. We saw the example of the GP good map devised an equal area projection of the world and we saw on figure 12-4 the Max Eckert. A cartographer who designed the Eckert Ford projection that was done yesterday. On page 274, this is what we have ended the, the seminar yesterday. We saw what is a conformal projection, show the shape correctly, but the size of the land mass is distorted. The farther the land mass is away from the equator, zero degree latitude, the largest it showed on that type of map. If you look at figure 12-5, if you look at Antarctica, it is the region of the world in the southern hemisphere that is the farthest from zero latitude, the equator. This is why it shows the size it does. And if you look at the equator on that map on figure 12-5, you see countries like, as an example, Central African countries, India, Indonesia, and so on, are smaller as far as land mass that they are usually in real life. Oh my God, I'm brighter here. That's better. Let me just set it up. So I look a little bit more visible. It's just the angle of the sun right now. So if I look as well in that figure 12-5, there's an important name there, name 
Géraldus Mercator. We call that the Mercator map. This is the most commonly used today. Is designed this conformal projection as far as 1569. It is still used today for marine navigation. Note the straight line of longitude. They are not in the shape of an orange section. They are not going at an angle like a crescent. The line of latitude cross the line of longitude at a right angle. That means at 90 degree angle. If you look now at figure 12-6 in the bottom of that page 274, we talk about this is a polar projection. It is conformal projection. All line of longitude or straight line, the line of latitude of arch or circle because you are at a pole. That's why you do it that way. If you would be in the North Pole, Northern Hemisphere, it would be exactly like that. But <laughs> my apology, you would have the latitude as circle starting in the North Pole and going south towards zero latitude north. That is the equator. And we're done with then 75 there. You have on figure 12 dash seven what we call the Robertson map. Let me just read that paragraph very slowly on page 275. Dr. Arthur Robinson created a map projection that was not equal area or conformal. The line of latitude are straight from east to west, as you can see on the figure, and the line of and the line of long prime meridian longitude or long meridian latitude or parallel the synonym and the zero degree is in greenish england just outside of london and don't forget every map in the world today is uh, basically uh, an heritage of imperialistic england with europe in the middle of each map and so on. So when you look at that type of map, zero longitude goes from Greenwich Village all the way to 180 east or 180 west. Longitude east or longitude west, west of Greenwich or east of Greenwich. So on that Robinson map, guys, all the other line of longitude are curved. This map projection is still used for many world map today. One into long line instead of leaving them as point. If you look at Antarctica, look at the way that bad boy is stretching in the southern hemisphere of that map. This is just another type of map. So the Robinson projection was developed by Arthur Robinson and presented in 1963, so 56 years ago. The National Geographic Society used the Robertson map for their world map in the late 1980s and most of the 1990s. So most of the map then you have in that book are Robertson type map. Just something else to learn that we are becoming more cultivated by doing it that way. Oh my God, I'm dark. Oh my God, I'm bright. There we go. I'm dark and bright. I don't know. That's just craziness, guys. A little bit of finish my morning coffee. Don't worry. It's still warm. If I look now at page 276, it's known. It's how the utility of how maps are telling the truth. Don't forget, guys. The map is a visual aid that allows you to quickly find information, find a place on a road map or on a world map, and so on and there's millions of type of in Canada. Where do you find the chicken producer? Where do you find the dairy farm in Canada? It can be absolutely anything. It can be a map that show the apple in each Canadian city. It doesn't matter. But it helps you to find quick information. Maps are used to compare different areas of the world. They, they present a clear picture of the impact of people on a planet. It is up to us to decide what we are going to do with 
that with what we see. So when you look at that first map on page 276, figure 12-8, it is a Robinson map. As you can see, the latitude east to west are horizontal and the meridian or longitude are curved like a section of an orange, exactly like the 1963 map of Robertson map on page 275. That map, guys, showed you as an example where most of the people live in the world. In the year 2000, the world population was thought to be about 6.3 billion people, and today we are at 7.85 billion. And you look at it, guys, if you look at North and South America on that map, you see that most people in the United States and in Canada live either living into the interior plain, and lots of people live on the West Coast. And this is a repeating pattern around the world. 80% of world population live less than 100 kilometers from a sea, or an ocean, or a waterway. If you look at South America, you can see a lot of people living along the west coast of South America. If you take an example, the country of Chile, and a lot of people, like in Brazil, live along the coast. If you look now at the continent of Africa, most of the people live into the sub-Saharan region, that means south of the Sahara Desert, but very close to the ocean as well. And same thing for the island of Madagascar in the Indian, uh, in the Arabian Sea, along the east coast of Africa. And if you look at all of the country from South Africa, all the way going north to about Eritrea, Ethiopia, going all the way up to Egypt, this is where the people live. If you look now at highly dense population, look at Europe. Europe is basically loaded of people that live in very small countries. If you look at India now, at the Philippines, into China, into Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Bangladesh, and so on, most of the people live everywhere there because there's 1.3 billion people in India alone. But look at Australia very low, very uh, sparse population, and most of the people live in the red dot along the main cities of Australia, along the Pacific Ocean. So you can say, by looking at that type of map, that gives you a quick picture that most of the people live around the world between the Tropic of Cancer and the Cod Tropic of Capricorn, they had the habitable zone and along seaways or waterways. And if you look at the Northern Hemisphere, we know some people live in Northern Alberta, in Northern Canada. But if you look at the legend, less than one person per square kilometer, same thing with the Northern of Russia or in the Himalayas, north of, ne north of India into Nepal. If you look at Australia, we know some Aborigines live in the outback in the central part of Australia, but it does not show any very dark colors because there's not a heck of a lot of people that live in hardened zone. That means zone where there's not a lot of water and agricultural soil. Now, if you look at that picture 12-9, the next map, that one is a Robinson map. And this one talk about where the fresh water is available on Earth. If you look at it, and just by looking at the legend from the very light yellow to the very dark purple, it shows you where the most of the water are in the world. So really fast, and you look at North America, and you look at a country like Canada in turquoise, Edmonton based cubic meter available per person per year. So in Canada, we have at our disposal between 20,000 and 100,000 cubic meter per person of water that we can use on our everyday life. And it is massively important. But look at the United States. They are between 5,000 and 10,000 
cubic meter of water a year. But when you look now at countries into the Sahara Desert, in South Africa, into India, into the Middle East, like countries like Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Qatar, you will have Syria, you will have Iran and Iraq, as an example, they have less than 1,000 cubic meter per person per year of fresh water to use. So by looking at that type of map, you see the have and the have not as far as water distribution. And this figure, you know, will be transformative. That means they will change from decade to decade where good land and water that used to be available is no longer available. A little set up oh, my screen is back. If you now look at the third map on page 277, figure 12-10, it talks about the amount of pollution of carbon dioxide polluting our atmosphere. If you look at the legend, we talk about kilo of carbon per square kilometers. When you look at Northern Canada, is basically pristine at zero. If you look at most of Canada, it were about up to 10 kilo of carbon per square kilometers. But if you look at the east coast of the United States, look at their color, they are either very dark pink or purple. So that means the amount of carbon per square kilometer released in the atmosphere by industrialization is way greater that in the Midwest of the United States in blue or in the Midwest of Canada, between 10 to 100 kilo of carbon. Now, if you look at Europe, look at the island of England, the UK, they are either in pink or in purple. Very small country, lots of people, lots of factories and industry equal more pollution. But if you look at the continent of Australia, look at it, guys, along the coast where people live, it's in blue. If And then the further you go into inland, into the outback, it goes from blue to green to white, basically, to no from square kilometer because of the dominant wind of the ocean. So that gives you a quick snapshot where the level of pollution are higher around the world and where they are lower. And it goes with the industrialization of the world. As you can see, most of the countries in pink and purple are into the northern hemisphere. North row to parallel uh, 90, that would be the North Pole. But look at the Southern Hemisphere. Nothing except maybe a few towns, a few big towns like Sydney and Brisbane in Australia. If you look at South America now, South America does not have at all any pink or purple, but they have a lot of carbon per square kilometers anyway. But if you look at the north of South America, you have the Amazon forest. The Amazon forest will suck out a lot of that carbon dioxide and replenish the air with clean air to breathe. Photosynthesis, we all know that from our elementary year into the beautiful course of science. The last map of today, 12-11, page 277, guys. It talks about surface temperature. If you look at the legend, 0 0.6 is the average, then you go into the dark red and to the dark blue. Why, uh, why is all of this carbon dioxide so damaging to our planet? The last map show how the world temperature were warmer than normal in 2003. If you look at the northern hemisphere, it was one of the questions of the assignment. Look at the northern coast of Russia, into red to dark red. If you look now at Alaska, it is over 8 degrees Celsius warmer than it used to be. Look at the north of Canada. We are at about plus 7 degrees warmer. And if you look at the western prairies where Edmonton is, into Canada, we are in orange. That means the temperature rise by about four degrees because of the amount of carbon dioxide 
created by industries that cause global warming. But when you look at countries along the equator, they are about the same temperature than they used to be. So global warming, we can deduct that surface temperature mostly increase in the northern region of the northern hemisphere, like Alaska, northern Canada, northern Russia, Russia, Finland, Norway, and so on. But in the countries of the northern hemisphere, particularly in Europe, if you look at Europe, it showed that carbon dioxide has increased the temperature of most of the country of northern Spain, France, Germany, northern Italy, as well as Tunisia, Algeria, into the northern African country. And when you look now at the southern hemisphere and you look at Antarctica to the left by the legend, you have red and dark red maroon that show that this part of Antarctica is the one warming up at surface temperature the fastest. You all know then huge chunks of ice pack of breaking from that region of Antarctica close to what we call Elephant Island. That would be a series of islands between the southern tip of Antarctica and the southern tip of South America into Argentina and Chile. So that part there, that surface warming, cause ice pack that are there for thousands of years to break apart and to melt into the Pacific Ocean and petting navigation and threatening giant boats because some of these ice pack are dozens of kilometers in length by kilometers in thickness. And also it releases fresh water into salt water that may be playing tricks on mammal marine life that goes along the Antarctica to basically to eat and to make their babies in the case of the giant blue whales. So this type of map help you by looking at them by snapshot of reality in time according to mapping. Tomorrow, guys, it is Wednesday. It is the no class day, and it will give you a big opportunity to work and work and work into completing your class. We will be hosting our weekly Microsoft theme where we're going to chat with each other and cover a little bit of that book. That section will be done on Friday through the YouTube. Next Monday, the 15th, I'm basically going to have my class, but starting to summarize the Canadian Study 25 to piggyback a couple of days later into a quick transition to introduce you to the Social Study 10-2 course, or 10-1 anyway, where the main, the main topic is international globalization and the role in Canada of Canada, my apology, into a globalized world. Before I go, I would like to congratulate some of you that have already submitted Learning Guide 12 and have now completed all online learning assignment course. Very proud of you guys, very proud of you. And for those of you that are still catching up, don't worry guys, just roll up your sleeve and just keep working and keep submitting assignment for all of your course and you noting know will improve and get better. No teacher want to have to fail a student because they have not worked. It's the last thing a teacher want to do. But I do not want to be in a situation where for that Canadian Study 25, someone have to redo that course. It would be just like shameful. That would be sad. So guys, keep working hard. Keep following the directive of our Alberta Chief Health Officer, Madame Henshaw. Keep washing your hands, keeping your social distance because you know next Friday the 19th of June, we will be going from phase one to phase two of the confinement. 
but it doesn't mean that everything is resolved. Far from it. And don't forget to have a thought for today in the United States, it is the federal and burial that African American, Mr. George Floyd, that has been murdered two weeks ago by a police officer in Minneapolis. You know, there's a world movement right now named Black Lives Matters to better integrate visible minority into mainstream societies around the world. That movement started in the United States many, many years ago. But those tragic events that we witnessed live on television and on the internet has shifted gear, hopefully, for the best. So guys, keep have a thought for all of the injustice, prejudice that still happen around the world today. Racism is omnipresent around and it needs to be taken down. Guys, miss you. Have a lovely afternoon. Enjoy the beautiful weather. And don't forget, if you go get yourself an ice cream cone somewhere, I don't like you. Bye, guys.